everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello to everyone watching at home and hi to everyone in the audience. So first I'm going to introduce Dr. Sophie Nichols. She is an early modern historian specialising in the history of ideas in the French wars of religion. She read Ancient and Modern History at Oxford and holds an MPhil and PhD in Political and Intellectual History uh, from Cambridge, uh, where she became a junior research fellow and is now a lecturer in early modern history. Um, and uh, joining us on the screen is Kate Moss, OBE. Uh, Kate is the author of nine novels and short story collections, including the number one best-selling The Burning Chambers series, The Burning Chambers and the City of Tears, um, as well as the multi-million selling, and I hope I pronounced this right, Langdok, Langdok trilogy? Longadoc. Longadoc trilogy, uh, <laughs> Labyrinth, Sepulchre and Citadel. And uh, the number one best-selling Gothic fiction, including um, The Winter Ghosts and The Taxidermist's Daughter, uh, which she is currently uh, adapting for the stage uh, for this year. Her books have been translated into 38 different languages and published in more than 40 countries. She's also written four works of non-fiction, um, including An Extra Pair of Hands, um, four plays, contributed essays and introductions to classic novels and collections as well. Her novel for quick reads, The Black Mountain, will be published um, this month, I think, April? Thursday. Thursday, this Thursday. Mm -hmm. And um, she's also one of 12 writers contributing a story to a new Miss Marple collection of short stories, which will be published in September this year. A uh, little bit, little bit more. <laughs> this is the longest bio, but um, <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot of achievements. I'm very here. old, you see. Yeah. I've been around a, a long to, time. A lot to uh, cover. So Kate is a champion of women's creativity. She is the founder director of the Women's Prize for Fiction, uh, which is the largest annual celebration of women's writing in the world, and she sits on the executive committee of Women of the World uh, Festival. She's the founder of the global campaign, uh, hashtag Women in History, which launched in January 2021 to honour, celebrate and promote women's achievements throughout history from every corner of the world. Um, so we're really, really excited that Sophie and Kate are joining us today and I will hand over to you. Thank you so much. Thanks very much. Um, good afternoon. I'm delighted to be here to talk to Kate um, about her fabulous new book and especially those parts of it that are set in the French Wars of Religion, the wars between Catholics and Protestants which tore the country apart for more than half a century as it felt the full effects of the Reformation and Counter-Reformation. Part one opens in the Languedoc in the 1570s, which was a crisis point in the ongoing wars as attempts at peaceful coexistence and political reform had failed. It was also a time when the monarchy was especially weak and vulnerable to manipulation by the great French noble houses, and especially that of the House of Guise that we hear a bit about in the book. When Henry II died unexpectedly in a jousting accident in 1559, he left the throne in the hands of his young, sickly sons. His widow, Catherine de Medici, who also features in the book, increasingly took charge in the years when France was formally ruled by children, but effectively ruled by the Queen Mother. In 1572, when the story begins, Charles IX was on the throne, and the French Protestants were once more under threat, as recent edicts of toleration had been revoked, and the French noble houses were warring for political influence and dominance as much as for religious reasons. Catherine de' Medici and Jeanne d'Albret, Queen of Navarre and an enormously influential figurehead for French Protestants, had, after months of negotiations, uh, agreed on a union between their children, Henry and Marguerite, which was set to bring peace to the kingdom. But we know, however, that it was not successful <laughs> in, in doing so. So I thought I'd start by asking you, Kate, what, what drew you to this era of history in the first place? Well, firstly, that is the best introduction to this very complicated period of history. So if you could please come on tour with me uh, for the rest <laughs> of time. Anytime, Kate. <laughs> very helpful indeed. Um, well, the whole series, uh, which started with the Burning Chambers, which begins in 1562 on the eve of the Wars of Religion breaking out in, as a formal period of war. Um, the whole series sort of came to me oddly on the other side of the world when I was in a place called Franschhoek in South Africa. And I was on a book tour. I can't now oddly remember which book it was for. Um, but I didn't know anything about the French history of the Cape at all. And I'd arrived there and we had been driving through the wine lands of South Africa from Cape Town going to Franschhoek in the Western Cape. And as we went along the road, I suddenly saw this sign at the side of the road that said Longadoc. 
And I thought, that's really strange. You know, that's the region of France that I write about. Um, and then we got a bit further down into the valleys, and I saw that all of the wineries had French names, not English or Afrikaans or Kosa, or, but French. And then finally, we got into Franschhoek itself, and I saw the main street, and it was called Huguenot Street, <laughs> at which moment I smelt a rat um, and went to the Huguenot Museum, the wonderful Huguenot Memorial Museum at the end of the road, and discovered that Franschhoek means the French corner in Afrikaans and that a group of uh, Huguenot refugees had come across after the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, the, the very famous revocation in 1688, and had in part been responsible for the South African wine industry. And so it was just one of those moments I thought, there might be a story for me here. And the trigger moment was going and standing in the graveyard of the Memorial Museum and looking up at the beautiful Franschhoek Mountains that ring the town and thinking, you know, this looks like Southwest France. And what would it have felt like if you were a, a woman who had grown up hearing your mother and your grandmother and her great grandmother going all the way back 300 years to the land you were forced to flee as a refugee. You were a Huguenot and you had to leave for your own life. But then you found yourself on the other side of the world and it looked like the home that had been taken from you. And at that moment, I thought, I know how to tell this story of the Huguenot diaspora. And then, of course, I thought, well, where will it begin? And of course, it was always going to be begin in my beloved Carcassonne uh, <laughs> with a Catholic girl um, on the day that the massacre happens at Vassy, which is the trigger for the first war of religion. Mm. Uh, and she is just going to work in her father's bookshop as normal, not knowing that the whole of their life and actually the whole of France is about to be changed forever. Absolutely. Wow. Well, I have to say, it makes you very trendy as well, Kate, from the point of view of historians, because your story is so transnational that you move from France to the Netherlands to South Africa. Um, it's what, what historians are all trying to do at the moment, is try and put Excellent. European and <laughs> British history into a more international and global perspective. So well done from that, that, that point of view. <laughs> um, I was also very struck, I mean, as, as a historian of this era, that you chose the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre for, for this book as your sort of your, your point, the backdrop against which the lives of your, your central characters um, experience dramatic change um, and historians again I think we agree with you that St Bartholomew's Day is a watershed moment in history um, so this is when after the marriage of Henry and Marguerite that I, I alluded to earlier um, there's an attempt on the life of the Huguenot leader of the armies Gaspard de Coligny which fails but then um, kicks off in fact an entire crisis where um, the the queen catherine the queen mother catherine de medici meets a, in a royal council at night and we don't know exactly what was decided but mm -hmm. there there is um an attack on the huguenot leadership and there's a there's some decision is made to to get rid of the the leaders and to get rid of colony for once and for all because he's been a real thorn in the side um of the catholic um monarchy so he is assassinated but what what is really unexpected and difficult for historians to explain is just quite why then the whole city erupts into an explosion of kind of mad violence and there's a real uh, grisly bloodbath of protestants thousands of protestants die in paris over the next couple of days and nights and they're killed not by soldiers but by their own neighbors um, and trying to explain that as historians is, is a very difficult thing to do because we don't have that much evidence to work with. So I wondered, Kate, um, why, why St. Bartholomew in particular? Why the, the grisliest period of French history before the revolution? Well, I think um, one of the things that I can do, which you real historians can't do, is that historical fiction is about slipping between the gap of what we know and what we can imagine. And that is why I love writing historical fiction. And the other part of it is that if you want to know about the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, um, go and read a book of proper history by a historian who was a specialist in that period. My job is to create characters that readers adore. And it's their personal tragedy and story that is happening against the backdrop mm. of this massacre. Because as we know, within real history, as it is lived, 
And Lord knows, we are now, we know we're living through history now. When I was first a writer, uh, publicizing Labyrinth, you know, my first historical novel 15 years ago, I would say, well, we don't really, we never feel we're living through history. It's only hindsight that helps us. But now we know we are living through history. But all the things that happen to us as individuals on a day-to-day -day personal level are still there. And that is where historical fiction, and I, you know, is so, I think, so popular, mm. because it's that. It's like, what does a real person feel? We know the facts of St. Bartholomew's Day up to a point, mm. but what do my family feel? And so I wasn't going to write about it because it has been hugely written about. And there have been um, many attempts to put it on the page and the stage. You know, the famous uh, Mea Bia Opera, uh, Marlowe, the, you know, the, the massacre of the Huguenots, uh, Prosper Merrimay, Jean Plady, the great, the great Jean Plady. Yeah, the history is a little bit ropey, um, <laughs> but it's nonetheless a, a fantastic read. Ken Follett. Mm. Um, you know, there are many, many um, physical representations um, in, in the arts of the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre. So I had to say, OK, what can I bring to this? And actually, you, you put your finger on it, is that we are witnessing some terrible things at the moment. Uh, when I first started dreaming of this series, the idea that there would be a refugee crisis, that the idea that we would have war again, uh, the fact that we would have huge um, upheavals in political systems um, in the way that we're doing, it, it was not not in my mind. But of course, this is the point. St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, we will never know whether they, the intention was simply, as you said, to take out Coligny and what they called the war Huguenots, the leading Huguenots or whether there was an active attempt to create a riot, which is what happened. But what we do know is that it went completely out of hand, that chains were being dragged across the streets, that many people in that period couldn't swim, so people were being hacked down in the streets, they were drowning in mass numbers in the Seine. And that interested me as a historical writer. How could it be that neighbour could turn on neighbour so easily, that the mob, if you like, could be manipulated so easily. Mm. And of course, it's years of being told that the Huguenots are the enemy. You know, you wind people up, you tell them that that person doesn't count because they don't think the same as you, they don't worship the same as you, they don't look the same as you. And then you light the touch paper. Mm. And so it was... You know, it was a very sobering thing to write. But obviously, my job is to make it super exciting. <laughs> um, <laughs> and at the heart of it uh, is my family, the Joubert family. Um, one of their children goes missing. Mm. So they don't feel that they're witnesses to history. All they care about is where is their child. Mm. And I wasn't expecting that to be the emotional, critical moment, that it was going to be a lost child story. Um, but of course, again, that's always at the heart of refugee stories, how parents often are separated from children and they might never know what happened to their child. Mm. You know, it's the not knowing that is so, so painful, I think, mm. in this story. But I think you describe Paris at the time so brilliantly and you really capture that very febrile atmosphere of the city that is on the brink of exploding and has been for months, if not years, really. So it does take the kind of smallest thing to set off riot and violence in this era, but obviously the assassination of, of Coligny is, is quite important. But I also like the fact that you talk about the um, preachers on street corners whipping up the yeah. um, that kind of frenzy and the, 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 these feelings of animosity amongst um, Catholics towards all these Huguenots who have suddenly flooded into the city. And there's um, a social gap as well. I think you, you capture that really nicely between the kind of well-dressed, usually quite wealthy Huguenots um, and, and poorer Catholics in the city as well. Um, well, thank you. And, I, and of course, that's one of the things that's so interesting about the tensions. Um, as you said, um, wars of religion and these wars in particular, it, they were about doctrine and faith, but truly all wars of religion are about power. They are about who has got the power, how they're going to keep it, how they will demonize the other side in order to make sure that they are weak. And one of the things that's extraordinary, of course, we wouldn't use the phrase middle class. That's not a phrase that would be in any way mean anything in this period of history. 
but you do have in France this extraordinary thing that the nobility and the working class people, the peasantry, um, as they would have called themselves at the time, and the urban poor were Catholic. And the Huguenots were essentially this upper middle class, not exclusively, but it was a very middle class, very modern religion in mm. a way, because it was about skill and it was about trade and it was about having power over your own um, environment. And so that is what is also extraordinary. Paris was an ultra Catholic city and remained so right to the end of the wars of religion. Um, and in the, you know, the famous words, Henry of Navarre will uh, convert to Catholicism after the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre. He will then change his mind as soon as he's escaped, but he will finally become a Catholic with the famous words, Paris is well worth a mass. Uh, because until Paris uh, can be won over, then he is technically King of France, but he's not been accepted. He's crowned in Chartres, mm. uh, not in, in the usual way. So all of these things, I'm, I'm delighted that you felt that because trying to capture that kind of class um, antagonism mm. that was also live in Paris, as well as the faith antagonism, mm. uh, felt very important to me because I think that is part of the explanation of why the mob happened, you know, mm. why people just turned on, you know, normal people picked up the nearest thing to hand and battered women and children and men to death. Mm. And, you know, there's always got to be an answer about how that is made to happen. That mm. Even when it's within families as well. Um, yeah. Though your, your family at the heart of your book are very tolerant and they're, they're a kind of relief actually to, to meet your, your characters because they, are, they seem quite sensible compared to a lot of the, <laughs> the craziness that's going on. Well, um, you know, but I do believe, Sophie, just sorry to interrupt just no, no. before you ask the next question, mm. is th that's something that um, I think a lot about as, as a human, <laughs> yeah. but also as a novelist is that I still believe, despite evidence to the contrary, that is all around us on our television screens and our phones and all of this, I still believe that the majority of people are decent and they want to live in harmony with their neighbours and they don't want to hate people who don't look like them or think differently from them. But the extremists on every side, in every period of history, are very good at manipulating. So if you like, they eat away at the edges so the people who are slightly unhappy about the Huguenots being in Paris can easily be made you know, to believe that that attack over there last night, you know, you heard a Catholic girl was attacked by a group of people. It was the Huguenots that did that. Now, propaganda has always existed. And so for me, it's that interest about how people hold on to their humanity when everything around them is encouraging them to let it go. Mm. And we are seeing this, obviously, right now. And we saw it during the Second World War and we saw it in Bosnia in the 80s. You know, we know these things happen. And so the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre is an extraordinary political uh, kind of microcosm of how, how an ordinary person can be turned into a monster mm. for a few hours even. Well, I, and I think a lot of the, um, the Catholics in Paris really think they are cleansing the city. There's this um, very sort of strong um, theme, if you like, in the, in the sermons that are being delivered at the time, that this is a kind of crusade against heresy. Yeah. Um, and it's a kind of holy war. And the Old Testament is full of calls to war. Um, so there is, there's a lot of rationale, actually, behind what looks to us like total madness as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I wondered if I could bring you back, actually, to, to you. You mentioned we were, were talking a little bit about the literature and the fact that writers and poets and artists are so, so interested in this, uh, in this era. And you, I think in your historical note, you mentioned Alexandre Dumas um, and his play. And I wondered if that had been a particular uh, inspiration for you. Um, fun, funnily enough, no. <laughs> um, only because I, as you know, at the heart of my, uh, all of my fiction, um, except for the Winter Ghosts, maybe, but at the heart of all of my fiction is telling stories underheard or, or unheard stories of women. Mm. And so almost all of the very um, famous uh, works of art around the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre have been written by uh, men and from a male gaze into that. Whereas my interest in historical fiction is, yes, but the women were there too. 
what about us? Mm. So although obviously I, I read all of these things and I, I've you know, seen the operas and read poetry and plays and all of that, um, mostly for me that's about my interest in seeing how this particular event was perceived, either at the time or subsequently. And of course, what we have with the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre is that people had no idea really about a lot of these things. And our interpretations of it, in art in particular, in painting in particular, are quite stylized and they are quite a long time afterwards. The closest to the actual event actually is Marlowe, mm. who is a relative contemporary, not, mm. he wasn't there. So we don't actually have any art from the day and the very, very famous painting um, that is always, you know, which is completely um, out of perspective because you can see Coligny yeah. being thrown out of the window mm. and you can see Catherine de Medici down in the, you know, she wouldn't have been wandering around at that moment. You no, know, she's we, we staring at a pile of bodies, isn't staring she, at in a pile the background? Of bodies, which yeah. hasn't started when Coligny's thrown out of the window. <laughs> um, but that is, you know, it, so it's these things that do interest me as, um, as a reader myself, um, as well as as a writer, that I'm very interested in how seminal moments of history are interpreted and 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 often misinterpreted mm -hmm. by later artists and then what that means so what i was trying to do was go back to okay let's look, use some common sense so if i am looking at this through the eyes of my lead characters my lead characters uh minou joubert mm -hmm. uh, her husband is piet who is uh half dutch half french uh they are wealthy Huguenots, they are in the city, they have their entourage with them and they have their children with them. So what would they be saying? So trying to drill it right down to the street they're in, because they won't be seeing this big um, epic looking down as you would from a film or a mm. piece of theater. You know, what Pete sees is, hang on a second, this is very strange. Uh, these soldiers have arrived and these are people who belong to the Duke of Guise and hang on a second they're armed they seem to be breaking into the house where Coligny is trying to recover from having been shot at by an assassin and they're being let in and then so that's that's if you like my inspiration is trying to take it right down mm. to what one person is saying not the epic scope it's only when they escape and they realize they're going to have to leave one of their mm. children behind to save everybody else, the Sophie's Choice moment. Yeah. And it's only when they go into the street, they see that the terrible stuff they're seeing outside their window is happening in the next street too, and the street after, and the street after that. So that's my inspiration. Mm. It's trying to put myself in the eyes of women who were there. Yeah, um, wonderful. And uh, well, uh, you mentioned Marlowe, and you have Marlowe and Milton and T.S. Eliot in your epigraph. And I wondered if you might tell us about your, your choices there. Well, it's, it's, it's vexing for me because uh, part of that, you know, is uh, my, my big new um, non-fiction book, history book, which is called Warrior Queens and Quiet Revolutionaries, comes out in October. Mm -hmm. And it is absolutely a book about how history is made and how women are actively, as well as casually, left out of the history books. It's a celebration of women rather than a, a moan. But one of the things, therefore, I always try to do is have women's voices in the epigraphs and all of these things. But... <laughs> It, firstly, T.S. Eliot, you know, I, I would never have anything quite so, you know, childish, I suppose, as a favourite poet. Um, but he is absolutely one of my favourite poets. Mm. Um, and Good I choice. think that he is one of the people that writes so beautifully about faith. Um, I think Four Quartets is one of, is a, an amazing meditation on the mm. nature of faith. Um, and it just seemed appropriate. Marlowe, that was the most con contemporaneous a piece of writing about the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre in mm. terms of a, a piece of art. And I felt it earned its place. Um, and Milton, I, Paradise Lost is still, I think, one of the great works of art in any language, in any period of history. And again, at the heart of Paradise Lost is the battle between good and evil. Mm. And what we are seeing at, at St. Bartholomew's the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre is precisely that. We are seeing a battle between good and evil and how good people can be manipulated to do evil things. And again, I just felt, you know, 
you can't beat Milton. You just can't <laughs> beat those. <laughs> so I'm afraid on this occasion, there are no women quoted at the front of the <laughs> well, yeah, They're very good choices. It. Very good choices. <laughs> <laughs> well, I liked the uh, the quotation from Elliot in particular about uh, in particular about sort of looking back, um, the backward look behind the assurance of recorded history. This idea that there's a sort of an instability uh, and the primitive terror, and I think that yeah. that that certainly captures the Saint Bartholomew's Day massacre very very well. Well, I mean, it is interesting actually if we think about uh, Marlow and Milton that. Uh, and if we sort of move to, to France and some of your evocations, Kate, of the, um, the cultural achievements that are being, um, uh, being um, gained in this, in this era, particularly the, the construction of the Louvre, I, I love that you brought in those sort of architectural mm -hmm. points as well, because France is in total crisis, but it's also experiencing, mm -hmm. like every other European country, a renaissance in culture and art. Um, and actually at this point in time, shaking off some of the Italian influence and trying to establish a very French, a distinctly yeah. French culture and embrace um, aspects of the French vernacular and things. But the, the construction of the Louvre, which was just a crumbly or cold hunting lodge effectively in the center yeah. of Paris, which wasn't even really effectively the capital um, until the beginning of the century, to start to construct that as a, um, as a palace and a, and a symbol of power is really quite important. So were you, what, what sorts of research were you doing when you were, when you were preparing for, for this book and why did you select the, those sorts of um, architectural well, bits that you did? Well, I, I, think, um, I think that one of the great disservices all of us has is, and, and I think we're, we're living through that absolutely at the moment, is the idea that things are, you're either 100% on this team or 100% on that team, that everything's black and white. Uh, there's no nuance. Um, it's very straightforward. You can always spot the goodies and the baddies and you know all of that kind of thing. And it was really important to me to firstly, you know, I know uh, from the kindness of people on social media or sending letters or emails, um, I know that one of the things that people enjoy in my books is the kind of the texture mm. of life as it feels at the time, um, particularly landscape and in this case, the cityscape of Paris. And so painting that world for, for the reader so that she or he can feel that they can absolutely know that if they were walking down a partic this particular street, the kinds of buildings they would be seeing. And Paris at this moment is, is still, as you say, essentially its old medieval self. Lots of narrow streets. You know, we have to strip away housemen uh, we have to strip away all the boulevards, all mm -hmm. of the things that we think of as, as Parisian and very distinctive about Paris, and go back. I wanted to uh, capture that, that it was actually a very confined, overcrowded, medieval city, essentially. Mm. And therefore, how dazzling the new building would be. You know, it, that extraordinary thing, as you say, the Louvre was like this crumbling old muck, really. Um, and then there it was suddenly being transformed into something else. And it was the artists that were doing this, the sculptors, lots of white building happening at the moment, not like it is now in Paris. And we've seen, you know, the, obviously the 19th century Paris, but there was a lot of that building happening. And the way that I research is being there. Uh, my husband uh, lived in Paris for many years and it's a city that I know well. It's not my city. I don't have an affection for it like I do for Carcassonne or for Toulouse, but I do it very much enjoy being in Paris. So my first job in research was to go there and think, okay, so in this period of history, my period I'm writing about now, starting in 1572, Paris is tiny because in fact, the walls are just where the Tuileries Gardens were being built for Catherine de Medici, um, right to the Bastille at the other end. Now there's a big, huge road, the Rue de Rivoli, that you can kind of walk the whole thing. But you know what? If you walk fast, you can do that walk from one side to the other on you know, the, the right bank in 20 minutes. So that immediately changes the way that I write that city. Mm. And then I walk north to where the walls were, and then I walk south, and I go um, you know, into the island and off. So I look at the Saint-Chapelle, and I look at Notre Dame, and I walk across to the left bank and do exactly the same thing. And suddenly then, I know how to write those scenes because actually the idea that you could shut the whole city down seems impossible when mm. you look at Paris today. 
But the minute you capture that claustrophobic, tiny, tiny amount of space, mm. you think, oh, yeah. Well, of course, you just shut all the gates. Yeah. It's quite easy to, to trap everybody inside. It's like a gigantic ambush. So I do all of that. I visit um, every possible place that is still intact <coughs> from that time. Much of it is gone because of the massive rebuilding of Paris of the 19th century. Um, but there are lots of places that are there. Um, I lurk about in places like the Sainte Chapelle, uh, <laughs> looking at the amazing, extraordinary light in the buildings. Mm. Um, and I always go, um, interestingly enough, I always go first as a tourist. I buy a ticket <gasps> at the gate and I go in like everybody else. Because what I've learned is that when I, because people are very kind, when I ask a, a real historian um, to show me around or I'm in touch and, and do it like that, they tell me all the things that they know with their huge knowledge and expertise. But what I need to do to start with when I'm trying to write for a general reader is to experience going into Sainte Chapelle, for example, and just going, this is incredible. Because my characters will be doing that. Mm. They won't have been given a guided tour by the person who runs the Sainte Chapelle. <laughs> um, and, it's, and then afterwards, I go and get that help mm. um, from historians and asking. So, for me, it's, I always describe research as two things. It's here, so it's reading all the books, reading the history, uh, going into the archives, uh, going to the museums, but then it is walking the pavements. Mm -hmm. And as I walk, I am stripping away what I can see back and back and back and back until what I'm seeing is 1572, and then I'm putting my characters there. Mm -hmm. So the physical research is an essential part of research for me. I couldn't do it on Google Maps. No. Well, I think that explains how, how you evoke the, the place so, so well. Um, I love how easy as well it is to get lost in your, your 16th century Paris, that it's so, it is confusing, it's a busy place as well, um, because it is pretty crowded and smelly. You make it really, <laughs> you can yeah. sort of really evoke the, uh, the, the smell of the slaughterhouses and things. Yeah, um, yeah yes, I mean, it's, and, and also all the things that we, we live in a very, um, in, in you know in you know london and in paris and you know cups on all these places we live in a very sanitized world mm. um in terms of smell but there's there's no drainage system there's no sewage system um uh, the abattoirs are there uh the leather makers are there you know all you need to do in france in particular more than england i would say although that it does absolutely exist you know you go to york and you go to the shambles and that's where all the meat was mm, yeah. um, but when you're walking around Paris, all you need to do is look up and see the names of the streets. Mm. And then immediately the, you, you start to get what would have been the smell of that part of mm. Paris. Um, and it's, you know, obviously it's a, a big no-no in historical fiction. People who lived in a period of time don't step outside their door and go, oh, it's really smelly. <laughs> because they know, you know, this is the world they know. But at the same time, that kind of... Um, I, I'm very interested, you know, I'm, I'm in previews for my first play at the moment, and it's a joy to have a lightscape and a soundscape. But when you're a novelist, that's my job to put that on the page too, as well as, if you like, the smellscape. <laughs> um, so, because then the reader is in charge of her or his experience. Mm. Uh, you know, it's, it's a very active business, reading a novel, in the way it is active in theatre. But television film is different because they have already made those choices for you. The camera shows you where you have to look. But in a novel, I need to give the reader enough to create the 360 degree world. And then they can manage their own experience, if you like, of the reader. Mm. And that's why research matters so much. Um, well, I was going to ask you as well about, about fashion, because you talk about the, the fashions of the court, and I think it's the, it's the figure of the aunt, isn't it? Who's, so, who's sort of obsessed with what they're all wearing. Um, yes. And again, in oh, contrast yes. oh. <laughs> to, the, to the sober dress of the Huguenots. Yes. And of course, that, that's, you know, part of the uh, propaganda. It's like, look at them. They're really drab. They're all in black, mm. uh, you know, and they, they, they don't have any fun. You know, they, 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 there's, there is all of that. But it, again, the point of research is twofold. One is obviously to respect the history, because these were real people who died. So... I have as much responsibility as you, as a, uh, as a practicing historian has, to try to get 
as much right as I possibly can. Because we know what happens when history is distorted. We are seeing it right today. You know, the idea, you know, that, that the, what's going on um, in Ukraine. We know what happens when history is distorted. Uh, it happens in every period of history. Uh, it's a cliche to say that history is written by the victors, um, but it's true. But it's also written with an agenda. And we need to know the reality of it, if we possibly can, as much as we possibly can, because it, it, it tells us who we are and how we got here. Um, and it can solve the problems often. So for me, the research isn't just about proving that I've done it, my homework. It's about a responsibility for history. And that's why, of course, I feel so passionately about it. You would be forgiven often for thinking there were no women in the past at all. Um, but we were, you know, women were always there. But the books were not written to acknowledge women's uh, presence. Mm. So with things like fashion, it's not just so that you know I've I know what they look like, or that it gives more color to know. But it's also very crucial to writing a story. So if Minu, my lead character, is, if she's got to run away from a soldier, I need to know what she's got on her feet. Can she run? Will all those shoes come off? Mm. If she's got to climb out of a window to escape the, you know, somebody that's coming in and is going to slaughter everybody how big is her skirts mm. how big are the petticoats time you know a bit further on when we get to the times of bodicing and corseting could could women breathe <laughs> you know all of these things so for me the research is one i love it and it gives color to my world and is something that uh, i know that readers really really enjoy but actually it's part of plotting as well mm. And we do get a distorted view, uh, as, as you will know, Sophie, because, of course, everybody who was painted, we haven't yet got to the Flemish school. We haven't yet got to the lowlands where ordinary people were being put routinely into painting. Mm. At this moment, most of the portraiture is of wealthy people. And, of course, they, do, they get painted in their best clothes. <laughs> You know, they don't say, oh, just pop round and you take me as you find me. You know, they're not in their Zoom outfit. <laughs> they, you know, they're in their you know, proper stuff. So therefore, people often have in their minds that Elizabeth I, or I'll use her, went you know, around in those massive skirts all of the time mm. and those huge headdresses. She, we know she did all the time. There is, you know, formal dress and there's relaxed dress. And we know that Catherine de Medici was in her later life. We know that she was very big. We know that she had very odd kind of complexion. We know that she wore black from the second hour. You know, we know some of those things. Mm. But my descriptions of Marguerite de Valois' wedding dress mm. are her own descriptions of yeah. her dress. I recognise and, them. Mm. Yeah, you would recognise them. And, and that's just a joy because mm. she wrote about... So then I just think, oh, my God, that's incredible. I mm. can just use her own words to describe what she would have looked like, mm. you know, on the gliding on the gold platform that yeah. led from the Louvre to, to Notre Dame. Um, and I do love all of that detail. Mm. You know, I love that detail. And then it was incredibly hot on the day she got married as well. And she was wearing this thick ermine cloak. And you could imagine the poor girl sweating away, being forced into this marriage to this man who wasn't uh, particularly excited about marrying her, I don't think, either. No, and who everybody, every it's one of those constant things that people always talked about the fact that he his breath smelt because he chewed raw garlic all the time. Mm. And it comes that up. That'll do before, it. You know, yeah. it. That'll do it. So and not only does he not wear his clothes fancily, um, you know, he's got his hair in a slightly, you know, he looks provincial yes. to her eyes. Yeah. And her former lover is in the crowd, um, if indeed that's all true. Mm. And, you know, did they actually, did she actually consent? You know, there's a description mm. of a brother kind of pushing her neck down. Mm. Um, so it looked like she had said, yes, I do. Um, and then, of course, they all go into mass and Henry and his Huguenot entourage just kick their heels. Mm. And it's, it is, you know, everything about it is deliciously complicated. Mm, and theatrical as well. A real theatrical. challenge to, her, um, to yeah. her conscience because the Pope hasn't signed off on this marriage. So it's not sanctioned for her and for her family yeah. formally. Um, so there are all sorts of complications going on. Um, yeah. But the, the idea that this is supposed to bring about a peace and then kind of 
everything collapses into tragedy. Um, yes. It and couldn't be more theatrical, really. It couldn't be more theatrical. And also, you know, there, there's, um, you know, the, just before this, that, as you said, the two, these two great women of uh, the 16th century, Jeanne d'Albret and Catherine de Medici, um, I'm, I've been trying to say Medici like you do, because I'm sure you're right, but I've said it wrong for so long now. <laughs> I, it's just, I can't help it. Um, but this marriage has been brokered between these two great queens. And, you know, in, in the April and then in the June, um, Jeanne d'Albret is in Paris and she dies. Mm. And there have always been rumours and they were being actively put about then that she was poisoned by the Queen Mother. Now, that's one of those things where you've got to say, is that likely? Mm. Because it was, it could easily have meant the marriage didn't happen. And Catherine wanted marriage to happen as well. So everything about it, would it even go ahead? And this is what's so painful when you're writing this kind of history, because I think everybody on the 18th of August, when the marriage happened, I'm sure everybody let their guard down, mm. that they breathed a sigh of relief. This wedding has actually happened. Well, then there were days of celebrations and jousting and That's feasts right. and festivals, yeah. and it looked like it was all going to be okay. But I suppose we shouldn't That's forget right. that there were 4,000 Huguenots armed outside of the city. So no. there's this sort of, there's all this celebration going on, but there's this incredibly tense yes, underlying absolutely. And, you there. know, and, and the other thing is that I always find, I know alcohol was a lot weaker, mm. but one of the things that quite often it's, it always really amuses children and students particularly, is that people, of course, didn't drink water. Um, you know, water was dangerous often um, in, in the way that, we, you know, you'd drink from a uh, stream or, or something, but you wouldn't, you know, have tap. Into in your house, and coffee is yet to be you know to take over the world. Mm. Um, so actually, people drank alcohol all day long. It was watered down, and it wasn't strong like you know. It's not like drinking whiskey all the time. But that I always have in my mind that you mm. know by the evening everybody's half cut. Yeah, I mean everybody's drunk. You know, and you know, and, and again, the minute you start to pull these details into it, you can think, yeah. But the, that's less surprising, mm. um, you know, all of these things. And they had been basically all everybody on a three day bender. Mm, yeah. You know, <laughs> and it's a wedding. You know. <laughs> it's a wedding, and everybody's really hot. Mm. Um, there's too many people in the city. Yeah. Um, there will be people who can smell great food being cooked elsewhere, um, but can't afford it. And there will also be a lot of unscrupulous people because we know there will be it's quite likely an awful lot of people will be eating rat when it's supposed to have been chicken. You know, that's the other thing. Just think of all the possibility of yeah. those things. And the, 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 it, it's just like you like layer, layer on layer. Mm. And in a way, it's no surprise the city erupted. Well, you talk, You mentioned the, um, the the rumours surrounding the death of Jeanne d'Albret. She's she's sent a poisoned glove, isn't she? That's that's supposed to be how she she meets her end. Yeah. But she was uh, very ill, so it's quite likely she probably just died of natural causes. But the yeah. fact that the rumour exists in itself is very important for historians yeah. and I think and I think for novelists as well. And yes, again, totally. you evoke that um, the 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 all the kind of the atmosphere of rumour and gossip and hearsay and that sort of everybody kind of encouraging each other to, to fantasise and, and, it, and yeah. maybe put explanations in where they, where they don't exist. And that's sort of part of the story, isn't it, of how it, how it all erupts? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it is an incredible... I mean, of course, it's not, it, you, one has to be careful when you say it's an incredibly exciting period of time mm. because we must never forget that thousands of people died. Mm. And not just in Paris, there were copycat massacres throughout all of France. Um, and the historians can't agree of how many people died, but it could be 20,000, it could be more. Mm. We just don't know. But we do know that it happened. Um, and so that's the thing that I, I'm always very conscious of, that it, it was not fun for the people at the time. As a novelist, evoking this kind of extraordinary... Um, period of you know you could just imagine everybody on street corners and you mentioned Sophie the you know the preachers that were standing there essentially saying if you go and kill this person you will have God's blessing you know sort of it's armed assassins being being sanctified actually mm, this is sanctified yeah. violence you know yeah. um, and but as you say at the same time there are 20,000 Huguenots who are armed outside the walls 
and people will n have known that. Mm -hmm. You know, they will have seen them, and it will be, you know, a lot of warfare was still essentially siege warfare. Mm -hmm. You know, when we haven't yet got to the big pitch battles in history in quite the same sort of way, and so it's just you can imagine that every morning people there would just be that level of tension. Mm -hmm. And the only time I've experienced it is, you know, I got trapped with my wonderful mother-in-law with the ash cloud in Venice, and everybody rushing to the railway stations and trying to find out and trying to get out or you know many people i'm sure i was in london on one of the um football days when a huge numbers of people had come down uh scottish fans were in london and english fans and i remember walking down a street that i walked down a million 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 times and thinking oh i feel frightened because there were suddenly hordes of people mm. shouting and screaming <clears throat> and throwing things. Um, and it's that, so that again, as a novelist, it's the way that you kind of capture how, how you capture atmosphere is, is putting yourself in the shoes of people who mm. you're writing about. What would I feel as a small middle-aged woman in this in environment? Because, you know, the thing is people in the past weren't different from us. You know, they had different expectations, of course, had different attitudes, of course. Faith was something that just was. You know, God was everywhere, like air. Um, it wasn't a choice in quite the same sort of way that it is maybe in some places in the world, certainly now. So you have to take all of those things and what people expected and men's and women's roles. You can't muck with, the, with those things. But I still believe that fear is fear and that if your child goes missing your heart breaks. And I don't think that because life expectancy was less in those days that a parent doesn't feel the same. Mm. So that's also part of it for me is putting mm. myself in and because I think the human heart doesn't change that much. Not really. No, I tend to agree with you. I, I love that everybody escapes on a boat in your novel as well, because that really <laughs> was pretty much the only way to get out the of Paris. Because yeah. um, yeah. as Kate says, all the gates uh, of the city were locked. Um, and it was it was impossible um, to escape. But the idea of the the city gates being locked, we know whether that was a a trap to keep the the, the Protestants in Paris, or if it was to keep the Huguenot soldiers out of Paris. It's, exactly. it's just impossible to decide really on what what, what the sort of rationale was there. Um, but it was a relief to see your family safely off on their boat. <laughs> it was. It was a relief. And do you know when I started writing Sophie, the the thing is that I do a huge amount of research. And I know the sort of story it's going to be. And I know the trajectory of the story. What I don't know is actually what's going to happen. Mm. I, I know the real history, but I don't know what's going to happen to my family. So I knew that they were going to be in Paris for the wedding. But I didn't know who was going to make it out of the wasn't. Not till I was writing it. Mm. And that's, you know, that's very weird. The worst experience I've had with this is my novel Citadel, which is inspired by... Uh, the history of the resistance in Carcassonne mm. and the fact that there is a monument in Carcassonne which lists the name of all the men who died on the 19th of August 1944 and at the bottom a, a sentence that still brings tears to my eyes and two unknown women mm. and I thought I, could, I will never know who they are history will never know who they are but I can write a story of the sort of women they might have been mm. and I think that that um, in terms of the a testing of stories from history is incredibly important. But when I was writing the final scene um, of the death of those two women, when I realized who the second woman was, it made me cry because mm. I didn't want it to be her, but it had to be her. Mm. The story had led to that moment. Yeah. Um, and I do, you know, and I find there are some people who die in this book, of course, you know, my body count in a Moss novel is always quite high. Actually. <laughs> um, and often I, people who I really, characters I really love go, but it's about the story. Um, it, it sounds a daft thing to say, because you'd say, well, it's your novel, you can decide what will happen. But if you're writing your novel properly, mm. the story and the plot tells you what it needs. And so good, good characters get the chop. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think you remained remarkably faithful to the historical um, narrative as it as it stands the Thank historical you. record Thank as it you. stands um you say at the beginning that you know you're taking lots of um 
artistic license, but I don't, I don't think you took huge amounts of license. Do you, right. where, where do you think you, you maybe took the sort of the biggest leaps in your, in your book? Well, I'm really glad you feel that because I do feel very strongly about respecting the record. Mm. Um, I think, well, you know, for me, I mean, obviously, lots of novelists do these things differently. And um, I'm an enormous admirer of Hilary Mantel. Mm -hmm. But I don't really like putting my made up words in real people's mouths. Mm. I don't feel comfortable with that. So for me, though, we really did need a scene between Catherine de Medici and her daughter Marguerite. I felt that without it, we lost that. This is actually the reality of a woman's life. Mm. In the end, she's going to be sold off for the good of the country. That's what's happening. And the fact that she's one of the richest uh, and be most beautiful women, allegedly, in France is not going to make any difference. She has mm. no power. We know this, but again, that's what fiction does, is make you feel what it would have been like to be that girl. Um, and I, you know, I think that she was probably very scared of her mother. So I've written the scene in that way. Mm. But that is my imagination to mm. say that. Jeanne d'Alquay also... Um, I wanted to put her on the page just a bit because mm. I, I think they are such extraordinary women, these mm. women. Um, to be ruling for so long, to be such great leaders, uh, to have lived the lives that they lived. I, I kind of wanted to honor that and put that on, uh, on the page. Mm. Um, you know, I loved writing the escape from Paris scene. It was a really exciting scene to write. Um, I've taken, not liberties there, but would they have got out? They probably have to not. get out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but they probably, <laughs> no. you know, it's quite a stretch yeah. um, that just because she's a very wealthy Dutch woman, she, the, the soldiers would go, okay, love, off you go. Mm. Um, but I, I, I felt it was near enough to make mm. it possible. So that's what I mean by taking liberties. I really tried to never take liberties with the historical record. Mm. You know, when, when some... Um, novelists say to me yeah but it's it's a novel so it doesn't matter i say but you've moved the date of this key historical happening mm. if somebody said i've moved the death of Anne Boleyn by six months because it doesn't fit with my story it's like <laughs> you can't do that it seems to me yeah um, and i don't do that but what i mean is therefore that there are things that are about writing an exciting uh, adventure novel with jeopardy mm. and momentum and forward mm. pace um that occasionally you have to just go mm, yeah just give uh, Get a, get a, give them Just the bend the rules a little bit. Yeah. Bend the rules a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Kate. Um, it's been wonderful talking to you. I'm sure we can pick up on some of the themes we've been discussing uh, with questions from the audience. And we've got some questions um, coming in online as well, which I will keep an eye on on this, on this iPad. Um, shall I start? Yeah, Rebecca. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I'm taking advantage here by asking a question. Um, I just wondered um, if there's anything, um, Sophie, that historians can take from historical fiction. Um, well, I think lots of the points that Kate's been making here are excellent about the, the social side of, of history um, and, and evoking um, and bringing to life aspects of um, the historical record that... Um, that we don't do. But I also think there is probably more common ground than you might imagine between novelists and historians mm -hmm. that, um, as I'm suggesting, in the, in the record, there are so many gaps and there are so many archives that we've lost, uh, not, not least during the, all the destructions of the revolution in the Second World War. So there are um, moments when historians have to make a couple of leaps of interpretation. Mm. Um, and, and fill in the gaps a little bit too. And we, so we have to work with what's plausible, what's reasonable. But we carry on debating and arguing on the various interpretations of St. Bartholomew, for example, and we probably will do forever and ever and ever. Um, so I think the interesting thing for me is that there is, I think, a finer line between literature and history than we, than we often like to recognize. Anyone else in the room? Or shall I? I'll go. I'll go to the screen, but, but have some thoughts. Have some thoughts. Don't be scared. We've um, only got four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite good. <laughs> well, I have. I have a question here from another Kate. Uh, she says, uh, I, "I'm a huge fan of yours, and like many readers of a certain generation, 
my introduction to historical fiction was Jean Plady. Do you have a favourite historical fiction author that you'd recommend or a favourite time period that you return to and read about again and again? Oh, that's a lovely question. Well, I, yeah, I am a really big fan of Jean Plady. Um, it, it is very important that some of the, those earlier historical novels were not terribly good history. Um, there's quite a lot of really very ropey things that uh, appear in those. But I would say I love um, Mary Reno. Mm. Um, I very much enjoy uh, Robert Graves. So I suppose that my introduction tended to be that way round. Um, and, it, you know, for sort of much more ancient classical worlds, which is not my particular taste. Um, I came into historical fiction, however, um, with Walter Scott. And, um, you know, again, a lot of that history is super dodgy, but I still think that the, in terms of excitement and the sense of how history is a beautiful story, you cannot beat Ivanhoe. I mean, almost everything about the actual historical stuff in Ivanhoe is a little bit off. I, I do know that. Um, and of course, there are attitudes that are really very uncomfortable for modern readers about it, in all sorts of areas. But I think, you know, my period of history that I really like, I like the 13th and 14th century. And then the fin de siècle, actually. I really enjoy that tipping point um, in the years just before, at the end of the 1890s, and then before the First World War. So that, that is kind of, I like, I like periods of history where a country or even a continent is in crisis mm. rather than, yeah. Oh, we have, we have another question from, from online, from Bandit Queen. She says, I just wanted Excellent. to ask... <laughs> Excellent name. I just wanted to ask, how do you separate yourself from the emotions which one cannot but help feel, the horror of such a terrible massacre in 1572, or is that just not possible? That is a really excellent question. Mm. Um, it's... By the time I'm writing, it's all about the material and the story. When I first start researching something. So when I first started Burning Chambers, which is the first of this series of what would be four books, um, you know, uh, spanning the next one is, uh, will be out next year. Um, and then the fourth one will uh, finish up in Franchip in, in, in the Cape. Um, when I first started researching them, I would discover the numbers of people who died or, or all of that terrible record. It is about amassing information. The time that it becomes emotional for me is when, as I said, I start to put myself in the shoes of my characters and I start to imagine it through their eyes. So if you like, when it's the outside in, gathering all the information that I need, it, 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 it isn't terrible because I'm not finding new information. I am finding snippets of new information, but it's not as, for example, many of you will read the wonderful historian Anthony Beaver and I remember having a conversation with him when he had very recently been allowed into the archives and the extent of the, uh, the rape that had happened um, as uh, the Russians came in to Germany was becoming clear. And I remember this was, it, it's not new information for anybody who knew, but it was kind of new information that it had all been documented. And he said that that had been unbearable. With me, almost all the research I'm doing, it, it, it's not that I've discovered something that nobody's known before. So I go into the archive knowing that thousands of people died that day. So I'm slightly inured from it. But it, yeah, it becomes emotional when I put myself in my character's shoes. That, mm. That's the moment that, um, yeah, that sometimes it can it be a bit overwhelming. But you have to tell the truth. You have to do it. You can't decide to pull away. Because when we pull away, then the horror History is too often made glamorous and beautiful. Um, and the actual consequence on real human bodies is forgotten. And I think, again, that's part of the responsibility. You have to put a little bit of that on the page so that people know that war is terrible. Mm. It's not a movie. Yeah. Yes, we have a question in the middle. Not so much a question, but just to add on to that last piece. What I think so marvellous about your, your books, and this one in particular, is although I know a, a bit about, not like you, about the, um, 
about the history you're writing about and, and about the particular day. What your book, this particular book, has a, an amazing aptitude to do is to draw me, the reader, into it in such a way with the emotion of the story that I, I not only am I uh, much more knowledgeable in the end about the actual event, but through your story, I now sort of become an expert um, about, about the event um, uh, and with this marvelous story about it. I, I cannot, when I read your books, do anything except read your book uh, to, the, to the point where I find that I'm uh, giving an excuse of uh, having uh, something, uh, you know, either slightly ill for work or needing, <laughs> uh, needing a duvet day or whatever we call it or whatever. They are absolutely not puttable downable. So all I, would, all I would like to say is that I just... Well, that is very kind of you. Love your now, books. So, thank you so much, Sophie. I'm sorry to be completely ludicrous, but I am due in the theatre in now two minutes. Mm. So <laughs> I am really going to have to jump. So off. that's the um, alarm bell. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, that is the alarm. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you so much for being here with everybody. And making the effort. Thank you. Thank you so much.